we go any further in the service today, very early in the service, we have a presentation to Brother Dave McClellan, who is our adult Sunday school teacher, and the adult class has a gift to present, and I'm going to ask Sister Rosemary to come forward, and Brother Dave, you, I can't tell you to come on the red carpet, we didn't bring any red carpet for you to stand on, but we want you to come forward the, all of the Sunday school teachers do a wonderful job, but we appreciate Brother Dave McClellan, and she has a presentation from the adult class, and do you want him to open it up? They want you to open it up right now. Boy, that looks nice. Yeah, it's not half bad. He doesn't look half bad most of the time. <laughs> yes, and we appreciate Brother Dave. He, he uh, carries a lot of responsibility. Well, at this time, I'm going to turn the service over to Brother Jesse, and he is going to come and lead us from here for a little while. Merry Christmas from me to you, and it's wonderful to be in the, the house of the Lord this morning. And this morning, as Pastor Jonathan already mentioned, it's going to be a little different. And uh, at this time, a small ensemble is going to join me here up on the, on the platform, and I want you guys to get involved this morning. We're going to, it's going to be kind of taking the place of our congregation and special song and a lot of the, the first part of the service, and uh, we're going to be doing a lot of singing very familiar songs to you, and uh, as well as some, some narration and some scripture, and we just want you all to be a part of that, and uh, you know, we're, we're very familiar with what day it is and what we're celebrating, and uh, I don't ever want the Christmas story to get old to me, and I hope you feel the same way, where we could, many of us could about recite the, the, the Christmas story from scripture, but I don't want to ever let that story get old, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful story, and because of that story, we have the opportunity to be here this morning. And so um, it's such a wonderful gift that God gave us many, many, many years ago. And so to give you some instructions for this morning, you're like, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I help? Well, anytime you see words over there, you sing, okay? So very simple. Anytime you see words, you sing. And uh, anytime you don't see words, you're welcome to sing, but you might be the only one singing out there. So that's really the instructions I have for you, and we're going to get started right now. Centuries ago, God had a different method of speaking to his people. He spoke to the prophets, who then wrote down God's message. It was in this way that people knew what to look for in their coming Messiah. Many prophecies were made concerning him. The old prophet Isaiah received and delivered this message. Therefore, the Lord himself shall, come, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A son? Where would this baby be born? The prophet Micah had this important message. But thou, Bethlehem, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. What was the purpose of God sending his son? We hear again from the prophet Isaiah, Jesus the Messiah is being sent to preach good tidings unto the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and open of the prison to them that are bound. Till the 
Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth, forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Come and all has 
once gone that name shall still live on so magnify him loud and strong the lovely name of jesus cherish that beautiful name prophecies were finally fulfilled just as the prophets foretold them. Caesar Augustus sent out a decree saying that everyone in the Roman world was to be taxed. It was for this reason that Joseph and Mary made the long journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Could it be that as they traveled the many miles that Mary wondered what the future held for her baby that was soon to be born? He was to be the savior of the world, the perfect Lamb of God, that would take away the sins of the world. What did it all mean? What changes were ahead? A very tired Joseph and Mary arrived in crowded town of Bethlehem on that special night so long ago. Every inn was filled and there were no rooms available. Finally, in desperation, Joseph convinced an innkeeper to let them rest in his stable. It was in this lowly place that a tiny baby was born and they called his name Jesus.
the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace, good will toward men. As the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger.
And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying, which was told them concerning this child. And all that heard it wondered at those things, which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. And as it was told unto them, Psalm 149, 2 through 6 states, Let Israel celebrate its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly celebrate in tri triumphal glory. Let them shout for joy on their beds. Let the exaltation of God be in their mouths. Jesus did in fact come to this earth as a little baby. And like the shepherds, we too have a story to tell, but our story does not end in the virgin birth. As amazing as it was that the Messiah came, he didn't come only to be born, but in, in, in reality, he came to die and then rise again. He came to pay the ultimate price for our sins. He came so that what the angel proclaimed to Joseph would become a reality, that he would, in fact, take away the sins of the world. He brought joy and peace to an ever-hurting world. And in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 33, we can find the words of Jesus where he states, These things I have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. What an incredible hope that we have, friends. Join us in singing about the joy that he came to bring. Joy to the world. Praise the Lord. Don't we have a lot to celebrate? To celebrate the joys of what Christmas is all about. Sorry for throwing you a curve there, Brother Jordan. But uh, I do want us to take time to talk to the Lord directly, each one of us today. And. Um, I do want us to pray for a couple special requests. Uh, one in particular, let's pray for Ruth Ann Faust. Uh, she uh, found that she had COVID earlier this week, and she is now in the hospital at Ball 
IU over at Muncie, and uh, so let's pray for her. She wasn't planning to be in the hospital on Christmas Day, and in fact, originally they were planning to head south to their daughter and son-in-law's to be there for Christmas, but uh, things changed, and so let's pray for Ruth Ann, uh, Faust, and Danny, and then also Lois Wright. She uh, is, as well, suffering from the virus of COVID. I don't think that she's having any serious symptoms, but uh, let's pray for these two specifically from our congregation that have just taken uh, this virus in the last few days and pray that God will be with them and help them and bring them through this time. And then uh, let's pray for our community. As, as was just mentioned by our narrator, the shepherds, they went out and spread the good news, didn't they? We are now to be the shepherds. But as Jesse mentioned, it's more than just the message of the manger, even though that's an amazing message, but it's the message of redemption. In fact, as the angel said, as the scripture was quoted this morning, when the angel was talking to Mary and Joseph, the mention was made that his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall do what? Save his people from their sins. Praise God. So let's pray for our community. We have had many different opportunities in recent weeks to reach out and, uh, and uh, do what we can to share the message. And let's just pray that God will help us as a congregation to be effective in sharing the message of Christmas that's more than the manger. It includes the manger, but it's much more than the manger. I thank God, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, there are two here this morning that gave their hearts to the Lord last Sunday. And thank God, that's the greatest gift you can ever give. And what better time to give it than right around Christmas time. And I praise God for that. And many of us have taken that step in earlier days. Praise God. To God be the glory. And so let's, uh, let's continue to remember our newer Christians, that the Lord will be with them and strengthen and encourage them. And uh, let's uh, just pray for one another. And thank the Lord for his unspeakable gift that he has given. Maybe you have an unspoken request you'd like to manifest with uplifted hands. I see several out there. We, uh, we pray often for Sister Imogene because we uh, just feel like uh, we appreciate so much that she is still able to come and join us in worship. And we want to continue to pray for her and lift her up in our prayers. I would invite you to join me in standing as we talk to the Lord and you feel free as uh, is very customary here to just talk to the Lord right while I am talking to the Lord because he, he doesn't just have a one track mind. He can handle hearing all of us and all around the world while we're talking to him at the same time. So you join me in talking to the Lord from your hearts this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so very, very grateful for the privilege of gathering into your house to celebrate your birthday. As uh, many scriptures have already been shared and so songs sung that clearly give uh, direction to those realities, we thank you, Lord, for what message is found in the manger. We thank you for your willingness to come and to to take upon yourself humanity, that you might feel as we feel, that you might suffer as we suffer, that you might hunger as we hunger, that you might thirst as we thirst, and yes, that you might feel pain and sorrow even as we feel pain and sorrow. Thank you for being willing to pay the ultimate price of giving your life and paying the penalty for all of our sins. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful plan of redemption that is so made available through the gift of Christmas. And Lord, we again thank you for every person that is here today. And our hearts do go out this morning to Ruth Ann Faust as she is there in the hospital over at Muncie. I pray that you will be with her and be with Nanny. And uh, may they feel you near and may they feel your comfort and your strength and your presence. 
We also pray for uh, Sister Lois, who is also not feeling well. We just pray, Lord, that you will give her a touch, and may she get to feeling better. And Lord, for those that are, were not able to get out today, we pray that you will uh, be near to them, bring them comfort, bring them encouragement, and may they recognize the blessings of this wonderful day and what it represents. Lord, you saw every hand that was lifted for prayer today, and we are very well aware that you can look deep within our hearts. You can uh, certainly understand what is going through our mind, even at this very present moment. And we just pray that you would uh, administer the help that is needed in all of these different areas. Some represent burdens and concerns for loved ones, for family members. Some represent burdens and concerns uh, for financial needs. And some represent burdens and concerns for decision-making that has to be done. And Lord, we know that you are interested in all of these areas of need and you are able to give the help that is needed to each and every one of these as individuals. We also thank, Lord, of uh, Sister Imogene. We are very grateful that she continues to be able to worship with us. And we just ask that you would continue to bless her with health. And may she have the strength to continue as she desires to give praise and honor to your name at all times. We also pray, Lord, for those that have recently and recent days, weeks, or even a month or so have recently lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you would give them an, an extra special touch today. We know that on days, special days, just like this one, that the absence of those loved ones seems even more pronounced. But Lord, may they sense and feel that you are near and that you are truly the comforter that offers to us a comfort that exceeds and supersedes anything that we can receive anywhere else. Even as your word tells us that you are the God of all comfort. And Lord, I just pray that you would give the help that is needed and the comfort. I pray for the continuation of this service today as our desire has been to especially focus on you while we are just blessed with the excitement of the opportunity to literally celebrate your birthday in your house today. We just pray that you will uh, cause that everything that is yet to come and the message and the sharing of your word that it would be according to your plan and your purpose. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time, Brother Charlie is preparing to come forward, to prepare to share with us from the Word of God today. I will mention uh, to the children and young people, we are, we are not having children's church today. Uh, this is a special day for us all to be gathered together right here in this setting. And uh, thank you, children, for being a part of the singing earlier. And uh, thank you for continuing to be a part of our worship time. It's always a joy and a privilege to have Brother Charlie to share with us. And uh, I talked with him two or three weeks ago about sharing the Christmas message today, at least on Christmas Sunday. And uh, so it's a joy to have Brother Charlie to share with us today. And so let's just continue to give him our attention as he shares with us from God's Word. Good morning. Good morning, and what other, what other portion of the Bible what, what we'd speak from this morning but would be what? Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2, and uh, we'll be reading the Christmas story and uh, taking a part of that and looking at it today. But you ever been a witness to something? <clears throat> you ever witnessed something that maybe you were the cause of? 
I tend to be a little ornerier, so that's what they tell me. I don't know why. I think that's a rather unfair assessment. But anyway, I thought somebody was arguing with me. But anyway, some weeks ago I was uh, at my aunt and uncle's as we usually do. A lot of times we do on Sunday after church. And uh, they have a dog that, that's uh, part, I think it's maybe a miniature poodle or something. But anyway, this chair has a horn on it, doesn't it, Jesse? It has a horn on it. And uh, whenever I do that, that dog will just, it'll, if it's looking another way, it'll, it'll just turn its attention right at me whenever I beep it. And then when it does, continues to look at me, I continue to do it, and it's, it'll just cock its head a little bit either way. So a couple of months ago, I was, I was doing that, and I, I have pretty good hearing. And I heard my aunt in the kitchen, I won't mention names, but she's the unclaimed treasure, and she was, what's that noise? What's that noise? Well, some of you know that when you have a, one of these newer refrigerators, if the door's open a little bit too long, It'll start beeping. So I caught, I caught what she was saying and she what's that noise? Then she'd open the door and she'd throw it shut again. So I, I caught on. So every little bit I'd sit there in the living room as we were talking in the living room and I'd just go, well, what's, what is that? What is that? So, bam, just shut that thing shut again. Let's wait a few minutes. Well, I just slammed that door. I hollered, and maybe it's the other one. Try it. Slam. She slams the door again. Well, what's that noise? I just shut both doors. Maybe it's the freezer. Slam. Why well, just check the freezer? What's going on? Better try the refrigerator's door. Did you get it shut all the way? What is that noise? Needless to say, that went on for at least five minutes. It was one of the most delightful memories of my life. And come to find out, they were like, wait a minute. Is that Charlie? Surely not. And so to this day, you know what? She still hasn't forgiven me. And to this day, she still remembers what she witnessed on that day for some strange reason. Well, these these these. Characters all involved in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, all had a very important role to play in the Christmas story. We start in New King James in verse 1 of Luke chapter 2, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this, this census first took place when Cyrenius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the, in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you, you will find the bap, babe, yeah, babe, bab, babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was, this is where our reading will take up, our lesson will take up this morning. So it was that when the angel and the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. I look at that and I said, That must have been a king-sized manger to find all three of them laying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, 
they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who were heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And when the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. So as we look at this this morning, there are five things in the last several verses that we want to look at this morning. Um, there are many instances in the Bible, I'm sure as you have read through it, if you haven't read through it, if you've even read part of it, that at least I would have loved to have witnessed. Um, probably the crossing of the Red Sea would probably be my top choice because, I mean, to me, that's one of the greatest miracles in the Bible as far as God using nature to portray his... his um, his workings amongst his people. You can imagine those great walls as they separated and the dry ground they walked across. And then once they all got across, the waters came rushing back and drowned all of Pharaoh and his armies. But can you imagine being there on this night? I love choir music, good choir music. There have been some that made me cringe and my flesh crawl, but, but there have been some wonderful ones I've heard. I've heard the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir in person, and it was a great, great experience. But can you imagine what it must have been like experiencing that heavenly choir and taking up <clears throat> everything that they had and just running into town and experience what they did? But one thing I want to focus on this morning is what they did after. What they did after seeing Jesus. So let's look this morning at just simply entitled it, The Witness of the Shepherds. The Witness of the Shepherds. Let's pray. Father, we are here many moments of this service. We thank you for those who are faithful to be here today. Would you bless them for it? And Lord, may these words that we have to share that you gave to me be that which would encourage us to be able to witness the manger ourselves and to spread it out through our community. And Lord, not to keep the joys of Christmas just to ourselves, but that we would be a light into this world that needs it so desperately in our day and age. We ask these things in your name. Amen and amen. So leave your Bibles open or your, your electronic device there, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 18 and verse 20, focusing mainly on the shepherds and their witness today. So let's notice, first of all, their response to the message. In verse 15, it says, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into the, he into the heavens that the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Now, there, there are a lot of messages that we, that we get in the course of a day. We have voicemail. We, have, we have, still have snail mail. Anybody been getting a few, two or three cards in the mail? We still few people do that. I've already gotten about four messages from family and, and others this morning. One of my text messages saying, good, good, or Merry Christmas and, and all of that. That is traditional for us at this time of the year. So when you think about the response. I responded to those text messages. I can't hardly write very well anymore. But, you know, I responded to the text messages, you know, Merry Christmas and all those traditional responses that we give on such occasions. But we find here two things, two different one word responses here that we get to their message from the, from the angels. First of all, we find conversation. Conversation. Now, we are a very, um, Communicative type people, communicative type people. What do we say when we come through the doors? Good morning, how are you? Very first thing we say. Now, I'm not sure how that greeting came to be because there's been a few people I didn't really want to know how they were. <laughs> you ever been there, you know? Um, it's never good, it's never positive, it's always negative. And the last thing you want to do is go down through their laundry list of things that's wrong with them. But here we find that the first portion of their verse, we find that there was a conversation that immediately took place. It says, and so it was when the angels had gone away from the end of the heaven that the shepherds said one to another. There is something miraculous that took place, something divine that took place that got their attention, that got them to thinking and got them to considering, hey, Let's, let's talk about this. What, what, what should we do? What's, what's, this is a pretty amazing thing that we just witnessed. Again, what would you have said if you had been there on that great, that great, uh, that great Christmas Eve when all of that took place? When you saw the star and when you saw the angels coming down and all of that, we find here that there was a miraculous thing that took place. There was a conversation. Christmas is a very 
wonderful time to have a conversation with your friends and your family about what Christmas is all about. You find a lot of people don't really understand the meaning of Christmas, why it is that we give gifts. I think it's all about the monetary and it's all about the gifts that we give to one another, but the greatest gift we, as we understand that was ever given was to us in the, in the form of a babe wrapped in so swaddling clothes in a manger. Not only do we understand here the conversation, but there was also a determination. A determination. You know anybody that's had a determination to get something done regardless? Yeah, there are times in our lives when we are very determined about those things. Maybe your wife's more determined than you are, and there's a honeydew list on the refrigerator. Maybe there's an asterisk, or maybe it's underlined, or maybe there's a couple of uh, exclamation points afterwards. Yeah, I see a few smiles back there. But there's a determination. And here are these men, as they were talking, they said, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. Let's not delay. Let's not wait until our morning coffee. Let's not wait until we have these things that are maybe more impressing to us. But let's go now and see what is taking place. Let's go now and see what the response is. But we find here, even in our day, when you share the message of the gospel with people, is it, let's now go? No, the response to a lot of people, let's just wait for a little bit. Let's just sow our wild oats. Let's, let's wait until right before we die to make our souls right with God, and then, then we can go over. I've told you the story before about a man, and he was actually from our community. If I mentioned his name, there, a lot of you would know him. But I worked with him there at the factory, and he said, you know, I just want to wait until the very last moment before I die to make, make things right. I just want to live my life. I want to have my fun, sow my wild oats. And friends, within a year from that point, he was dead of cancer. Thank God he had plenty of time to make his heart right. And I'm trusting that he did. But determination is let us now go to Bethlehem. Let us now go and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. You know, what is it it takes to get our attention during the Christmas season? What is it it takes us to get our attention? You know, here it took an angelic choir. And I, I would think that would get my attention, wouldn't it get yours? You're laying there on your back as they're, as they're out in the fields not expecting anything and all of a sudden an angel appears to them. And the message comes, hey, guys, can I have your attention for a moment? You ever taught little kids Sunday school class or kids church? Boy, that's, that's a fun time, isn't it, trying to keep their attention? That's one area I was never blessed in. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more equipped with old people like me than I am with kids. Because old people, what are they going to do? They're just going to fall asleep on you, you know? But what are kids doing? They're going this way, that way, that way, and their eyes are going every which direction trying to look for the next little bit of trouble to get into. Or they're trying to find the little bit of next excitement. But here they were determined. They said, let us go now. Let us go now. There was a sense of urgency. Let us go now and, which, and see which the Lord has made known to us. Second thing we want to notice is in verse 16. Here they're running to their manger. They're running to the manger. Now, I am not a jogger. I'm not a runner. But there was a time when I was in Florida that I actually did undertake running at nighttime. I did not want anybody to witness all the jiggling that my stomach would do because my belly flops up here when I'm running along and uh, puts a red spot up here, you know, and I didn't really want that to uh, come to light in the light of day. And so I would run at nighttime, and I would ride my bike down to the, the, the college men's dorm. I would park it outside. Then I would go, I would walk down the lighted street down to Gomez Avenue, and then I would start the running because it's all covered with tree, ficus trees, and nobody could see me because it was nice and dark. I don't know what seismic it was on the Richter scale, but I would do my best to take a run. And so thinking about this, I did running trying to lose my pulpit bumper here, but they ran because of a message that was delivered. 
Verse 16, it says, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Again, as I said, I always get cracked up when I read that verse because it sounds like all three of them were in a king size, in a king size manger. Now, if you don't know what a manger is, it was actually a feeding trough. You're saying here the king of the universe was brought down in the form of man, and he wasn't even born in a in a in a in a hospital or in a uh, with a midwife or anything like that. He was just born in a manger. Yes, that's the way he came and took on human flesh, and he was born in nothing more than a stable. Two words here to describe their reaction. First of all, the urgency in the first portion of the verse. It says, they came with haste. They came with haste. Now that to me signifies that there was something that spurned in them, in their minds and in their hearts, a curiosity. There was something there. These being men who have probably been known that the promise would be fulfilled someday, probably never expected to be the first ones to witness that it had come to life. Literally, the Savior had come to life. To human form. And so there was a sense of urgency. There was something about them. Let's, let's go. And so they didn't just take their staffs and, 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 and amble through the countryside. No, it said they, they went with haste. They came with haste. There was a sense of urgency about them. And friends, I'm afraid in our modern day that there's no longer a sense of urgency in those of us who have witnessed the things of God. We've gotten so used to coming from the church with like a door on a hinge. We just come and we go and we've lost a sense of urgency about the things of God. We're so used to our pews. We're so used to our, our pastors and our Sunday school teachers. And we're so used to these things that we've, we've lost that message from the shepherds long or from the angels long ago. And we know we just kind of drag in and sometimes we race out, but sometimes we drag out. All the service comes and goes and we, we, we neglect to, we, to uh, heed the wooings of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thankful for our new brother and sister in Christ from last Sunday. Thank you for minding the Lord. But I've wondered how many times have we come and gone from the place of the holy without making due haste to meet, to have God meet our needs at an altar of prayer. When the Spirit was there, when the, when the witness of the Spirit came and, and began to deal with our hearts, when we rejected him. It says they came with haste. There was an urgency about them. And there was not only an urgency, but there was a curiosity. A curiosity, it says, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Did they have any idea what they would find? No, they didn't, did they? Why would, have you ever been called to a situation wondering what you would find? You know, there was a time when, it's a very sad story, but very early on in my ministry here, when I think it was Sister Lurie called me and said, could you run to the hospital? A young man has overdosed. And I was like, oh boy. And it was up, clear up at Adams County Hospital. And I made my way on, on, a, on a Saturday morning. And when I got there, it was too late. And seeing that young man there on a gurney in the morgue of the hospital was a very eye-opening thing. And I remember that so distinctly. Walking in, there was a young man who had come to this church as a youth. I don't know if he had attended youth camp. But I, I saw that nearly probably 18, 19 years ago. And I thought, you know, there's something there that could have been drastically different. If a dad would have loved him, if, if some things could have been different in that home. But, you know, I didn't know what I would find when I arrived there. I didn't know, what would ha I didn't know if he was still alive. I didn't know, but I went, with, I went with haste. And here they didn't know what they were going to find. Thankfully, this had a better story. It had a very sad but happy ending, obviously. You know, going to death is never easy, you know, when he died on the cross. But yet the, the end of the story is that he won. Thankfully, but when they were making haste, they didn't know what they were going to find. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know what was going to take place. But here they found the mom and the dad and the babe. It doesn't say there were anybody else there. It just says they found these three riding around the babe in the manger and Mary and Joseph attending to their newborn babe. You can imagine what that sight must have been like. You know, curiosity can compel us to do a lot of things. 
I've heard back in the good old days, I've heard stories about people who would get curious about revival meetings and, and camp meetings, and they would literally line the outsides of the churches, peeking in, trying to see what was going on in that old-fashioned old revival meeting that was going on. They heard the shouts, and they heard the people praising God. But again, the curiosity is no longer there in our, in our age, but so saturated with the gods and the cares of this world. We no longer have that curiosity. We no longer have that desire anymore. Somebody shouts in the church now, everybody's getting whiplash. You know? Why? Because we don't see it, we don't hear it anymore. Those things that we once coveted, those things that used to draw people, you know, may the Lord help us to draw people with our testimony, bring them into our church because there's something about us that makes them curious. What do they have? Where do they, where do they get it? Wonder where they go to church. There's something that's so different about them. And you know, friends, that has drawn a few people here. Your lives have drawn a few people here. And so they were curious and they made, they made that haste and they ran to the manger. They ran to see what was going on. The third thing we want to notice in verse 17, we want, us there, we want to notice they're returning to the multitudes. They're returning to the multitudes. It says in verse 17, now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told unto them concerning this child. It said after they left. Now I, you know, there's times when, when isolation can be nice. When I was in the hospital recently, there was, they said I had a touch of a uh, MRSA and I had never, he said, hey, I detected it last summer. I was like, why am I just now, why am I just now finding this out? But you know what? It worked out kind of nice because in the hospital, they left me alone for some strange reason. And it was nice. I had the hospital room all to myself. People left me alone and I was able to just relax and take it easy. And it was kind of nice. But you know, when returning back to, returning back to family was also nice. Returning back to public, as it were, was nice. Everybody's like, well, how are you? How, what, what happened? You know, getting back into the routine of things. People want to know. How's it going? I received text messages and, and phone calls and stuff of that nature. But here we notice a couple of things that they, that they said as they were going back into, the, back into the multitudes. First of all, we noticed an accomplishment. The first portion there says, now when they had seen him, when they had seen him, an accomplishment. You feel good after you get something done? Maybe going back to that honeydew list, you know you finally get one thing done, then she grabs the pin out of your hand and adds two more. Man, I just got one thing done and now here it comes all over again. Or you're a homeowner and you see these things, you finally get one thing done and uh, something else needs to be done. It seems like when you're a homeowner, nothing is ever complete. I have found that to be true. And just one major thing getting done, I've wanted to get done for all those years I've owned my home, finally get my barn site. If you haven't been by my barn, look, take a look at it. It looks really, really good. If one thing I really wanted to get done, and it's, it's all, now I feel a, a slight sense of accomplishment. I had Steve Levy Construction put on a new garage door on the side. I had another Amish crew put up stainless or a seamless covers on, on the front and on the back. Now it's done. It's accomplished. Everything I want to get done to that barn is now done. I feel happy about it. But guess what? There's still more projects to do. But here these men had accomplished something that, that you and I could never do. They ran and they saw this babe. And they said when they had seen him, they were accomplished. You know, friend, our lives are never complete until we encounter Christ. You know, I see people, and it, and it has affected the modern church as well, where they've lost sight of the things that really matter in life. They've lost sight of the Christ in the manger. They've lost sight of the things that really matter down deep inside. And I think about all of those things that are so important to so many people, but yet they lose all accomplishment in this life when they, when they neglect to encounter Christ. And here they were, they had taken that step. They left their jobs. 
said, forget these old sheep. we got something to do. I know we can't just walk off of our jobs in our modern day, but I'm saying, what's the most important thing to us? Is it making money? Is it possessions? Is it our favorite sports team? Is it, I was on my sister's Facebook the other day and, and I, I looked at an old friend of mine uh, from, from years ago, from college days, and all hyped up about the, the FIFA, the, what is it, the World Series of Soccer or whatever. And I was like, who cares? You know, it's just a ball going between, you know, and in the net, you know. But that's what, some, that's what gets some people up in arms about things. Oh, man, they'll shout and they'll do whatever, yell at the TV. Man, they'll throw stuff at the TV and break it. You know, what's good about that? You know, it just costs you more money. And I'm sure the coach isn't listening to you through the screen. But you see, we get all these, the cares of life, I think Jesus referred to them as. And we feel, feel like we, if we just gain one more thing, if we have one more thing, we're going to feel accomplished. But these men left their job. They forsook everything to go meet Christ. You know, friends, if, if God would call you to leave and forsake everything, would you be willing to give it up and go? You know, accepting the call to preach is one thing that was difficult for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll loop this in with the next word here. Not only accomplishment, but acknowledgement. When God called me to preach, there was something there that I said no to. I said, me? No way. You know, my dad had, had been a minister for 30-some years, and and, you know, it's not easy being a pastor. You know, it's one of the most difficult professions in the world. And I said, no, 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 no. Second time he came back to me in his faithfulness, he said, will you do it? And that time I knew I had to say yes, and I said yes. But you know what I had to do? I had to leave everything behind. I had dreams. I had plans to buy a home and, and do all of that. I had a good job at Fleetwood Motorhomes. But I had to leave that behind and go make make minimum wage, which literally cut me down to about a third of what I was making at the time. That wasn't easy, but I had to, I had to acknowledge what God wanted me to do. And so here in the last portion of Luke chapter 2, verse 17, it says, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. They acknowledged what they had seen. You see, there was a witness here that was going on. And so as they, were, as they left their encounter with Christ, what did they do? They acknowledged that we have seen the Lord. Well, they acknowledged we have encountered the Christ. We have seen the promise fulfilled that we've been waiting for for 4,000 years. We have seen the Christ child. The Christ is here. The one that we have been waiting for all these generations are now here. He has come, and they begin to make this known. It says, widely known, the saying which was told to them concerning this child. They didn't keep it to themselves. They took it throughout the countryside, and as they left, they must have been, I don't know what, what draw the crowds to, what drew the crowds to them, but I'm guessing they must have been shouting and praising the Lord and, and doing all sorts of things to grab the attention of, of their fellow villagers, village people. But they acknowledge what they had seen. And why is it that we're so quiet when we acknowledge Christ? The accomplishment that he has made in us. Why are we so quiet about it? When we encounter Christ, let's not keep him to ourselves, but let's share him with the world. Again, as I've said many, many times, that doesn't mean the world is going to want to hear what you have to say. But you'd be surprised how many hungry people there are out there who really need to hear what we have to share. Let's go to the fourth thing in verse 18. Now this is referring more to the witnesses that they encountered. But let's notice their reaction to the miracle. Their reaction to the miracle. And all those things, and all those who heard it, marveled at those things which would, had been told them by the shepherds. You ever witness something rather amazing? I've, I've not been in a place where I've witnessed something necessarily miraculous. But I've heard about things. I've read about things, miracles that have taken place. 
but I've never necessarily witnessed one with my eye. I've seen people who have been sick and they've been in church that we've prayed for. I've seen people, I've heard of people who have had cancer who have been healed. And I know we've got some cancer survivors here today. Thank God for that. But I take a look at this and I, I notice their, their, their reaction here. And it says two words that we, we find here that describe this, this reaction. First of all, is that they were attentive. First portion of that verse, and all those who heard it marveled. They marveled. So now we, we live in a day when we have itching ears. You ever seen a, a, a dog with, with, with it itches its ears? You ever seen that, Ron, in all your times of raising dogs? You've seen a dog? Why is it doing that? Because its ear itches. And when you itch, when you scratch it, man, it feels so much better. Yeah, we like those things. We, they like those things. We're living in a day when we have pastors and we have a lot of people in congregation who have those, those itching ears. Come and go from the place of holy, but do we really comprehend? Have we really paid enough attention to hear what the pastor had to say? Or have we been on Facebook as the pastor's preaching along or scrolling along on our phones? Sometimes, yeah, we know we have Bibles on there, but is it the Bible we're looking at as we're scrolling? Boy, it's awful quiet. But are we attentive when we come to the house of the Lord? Are we ready? Are we prepared to hear the things that God has for us for that day? Are we ready? Have we prayed up? Have we prayed for the pastor who's preaching that morning? Or have we prayed for our Sunday school teachers? Hopefully you do come to Sunday school. <clears throat> but shall we just say that we need to be attentive to the things of the Lord? says, and they heard all those things, and they marveled. You know, friends, when we pay attention to the Lord, we might have a tendency to marvel at those things that he wants to share with us. We might, want to, we might have that opportunity to marvel when we read his word, when we meditate on his word. But here these people marveled at the witness of the witness of these shepherds. It says they were attentive. Are we open to the things of God? Are we willing to open up our hearts, our minds to receive what he wants for us? Or are we selective? I've heard in marriages that there's selective hearing. Is that true? How's that? Exactly, yeah. And some reason it's mostly women that are shaking their heads. I don't know why. I, I'll leave it at that. I don't know. I listen to my wife all the time. I mean, there's, there's no... We've never had a fight. We've never had an argument. We get along just great. But you know, do we have selective hearing when it comes to our relationship with Christ? Not only were they attentive, but that led them to being receptive. Second word here in the last portion of Luke 18, 2, 18. And those things which were told them by the shepherds, they were receptive you know, I, I sometimes I get disturbed when, when people air their grievances. They air their grievances about the church to people who'd have no business hearing about it. Sometimes when we've gone to the church convention that a lot of us like to go to, they disagree with something. All of a sudden they get on Twitter, they get on Facebook, or they get on their little groups and they begin airing things to even people who don't even know what the message was about. And then they find this little, they find this little niche of com miserable comforters Oh, man, they shouldn't have said that. Man, man, well, you go and you put yourself in the place of that pastor who's standing in front of 4,000 people who God has given a challenging message to, and then you get up there and you try to deliver that same message. But we found, again, where people don't really like to be receptive. Why? Because they're afraid of what their toes might get stepped on. You know, friends, when we come to Christ... It means we are receptive to the things of the gospel. We are receptive to receive those things that God had in his, has in his word and comes through the ministry of the pastor or the Sunday school teacher. You know, God doesn't just randomly put his finger on a text and I think that'll be okay for that group. No, 
when I, I figured Brother Jonathan would want to preach this morning, usually it's the high senior pastor who preaches on high holidays, but uh, he acquiesced and said, you are, you know, you're, you're able, you're willing to do it, you do it. And as soon as I saw where I was going to be preaching, it was my Sunday, you know, the Lord began pressing on my heart about the, about the shepherds. It wasn't something that I necessarily anticipated, but it was for this time, it was for this day. And so it says here that they were, you know, they were receptive. They were ready to receive the truth that the shepherds were sharing. But are we open to it? Are we willing to say, Lord, you know, whatever it is in my life, take it out. Get rid of it. Prune that, prune that branch. Take away that baggage. Take away that, you know, whatever it is, that sin that so easily besets me. Lord, do away with it. Last thing we want to notice in verse 20, we want to notice their responsibility to the manifestation. Turning back to the shepherds in verse 20, it says, Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Their responsibility. You know, friends, when we become a Christian, we have a lot of responsibilities, but one of them is, first of all, we notice this, what the shepherds did was praise. Praise. It says, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. Amen. They were praising God for those things that they had seen, things that they had heard. I don't know what conversation took place around that, that, that manger, that king-sized manger, but I'm telling you, there was something, that conversation that took place that changed these men's lives forever. And sometimes I wonder, did they really, did they really go back to the sheep? <laughs> did they just leave them out there to wonder? Some of you went to... Maybe some of you went to uh, the Holy Land a couple of years ago. Maybe you saw the descendants of some of their sheep. I don't, maybe out in the wilderness. Who, who knows? But I'm thinking here, you know, friends, we, and I'm talking to myself here, we get so far behind on our praise for what we have witnessed, what we have seen, what we have heard. We're so far behind on our praise. We get caught up in the, in the, in the monotony of the days. Lord, we need this. Lord, we need that. Lord, are you going to work? Are you going to do this? When we stop to fail, to, when we stop and we fail to praise God for what he has already done. Yeah, that's, part of the, that's part of the thing. You know, we like, to, we like to receive thanks, don't you? I don't so much enjoy receiving gifts, but I like giving more than I do like receiving. You say, well, that's kind of weird. No, it's not. When you grow up a little bit, you'll, you'll be the same way. At least I think. I don't know. I mean, I like to receive gifts. Don't get me wrong. But I like seeing the surprise on people's faces when I give them. I got my sister something for Christmas, and uh, she, was, she was thrilled. She was ecstatic about it. I knew that she liked it, and so I got it for her, and she was very, very happy with it. And, you know, it's that response that I like to see on people's faces when I give them a gift. And she didn't disappoint me. She was very, very happy with it. And, and so, therefore... You know, God does things for us that he might be glorified. That he might be glorified and that we, how do we glorify him? By praising him. And lastly, the last, last word here, not only praise, but we notice their presence. For all things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. That's what they were glorifying. You know, <clears throat> Friends, even if you served the Lord even just a, even a week or just or, or, or for years, there have been a lot of things that we've witnessed that we can praise God for. Amen. And how are those things made known because of their presence? Because of their presence. Friends, we were living in a day when you see a lot of churches being shuttered. I, have, I don't know if I've confessed this before, but I'm going to confess sin that Brother Jonathan and I got into one time is that we actually broke into a building. We did. We were going somewhere and all of a sudden we went past this little church out in the middle of nowhere. And so I've, I've told him, I said, as we were approaching, I said, I wonder what that, the inside of that old church looks like. And so we went in and he, I mean, he, he did a karate chop and busted that door down. Splinters went in 50 different directions. I didn't know he knew Kung Fu. But he did, not really, but um, pastorally speaking. But he, um, but we went inside that church that was now nothing but storage. 
we looked around, there's, there's still a little bit of remnants of days gone by. But you know, friends, I thought, I wonder what happened here. Was there a split? Did, you know, what happened? You know, friends, that church is shuttered today. But it's not the only one. I'm thinking, what happened? Did God's presence depart? What did Ichabod be written over the door? You know, friends, the presence of God will go where the presence of God is welcome. So do we cultivate an atmosphere in our lives and our hearts that says, Lord, I want to be where you are? I want to be where your presence is? Or are we more comfortable staying at home and flipping the channels saying, there's, there's Joel Osteen. There's some church. While the presence of God, I'm sure maybe may manifested there. But what about being in the presence of God? Worshiping with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Here it says, for all the things. They were praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. They were present. There was a presence about them. God's presence was there. And so, therefore, friends, on Christmas Day, as we're wrapping this up, I promise, let's not forget that God wants our presence. Not P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, but more importantly, he wants our P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. He wants our presence. Conclusion, two verses I find very, very compelling at this point. John chapter 10 and verse 14 where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. Why well, aren't we all God's children? No. We're all God's creation. But only those who have confessed their sins and who are living for Christ are his sheep, are his children. Some verses later in verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Amen. So friends, as we look at this, as we, this is the concluding thought here. The message from the shepherds, the witness of the shepherds is so important for us in our day because God knows where you are. He knows who you are. And he wants you to be his sheep. He wants, you to, he wants to be your shepherd. He wants you to be in his flock. Remember it says where one goes astray, he leaves the 90 and 9 and he goes after that one to compel them to come back. On this Christmas morning, what would be a better thing for us to do to give our presence to him? Give of ourselves to him. And friends, let's acknowledge him this morning as we stand. And uh, let's, let's, I'm going to have Sister Lori play something very softly on the piano with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. What better day it would be for somebody to give their hearts to Christ than on, than on Christmas morning, December the 25th. I'm not going to wait long, but maybe God has spoken to you about a need in your life or Maybe you need to come to him. Anybody at all? I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by mine, my own. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Are you hearing the shepherd's voice? Are you the one that's gone astray? Anyone at all this morning? One more time where you heads bowed and eyes closed. We're praying to ourselves, reflecting inwardly. Anyone at all have a need in your heart?
the Lord add his blessing to his words today. Turn back over to Brother Jonathan. Please.